welcome everyone to this A Thinking with Ed Miliband. Um, there, there are a number of things, Ed, that have already uh, struck us about this evening. One is the number of people saying, no, we want to hear Ed singing it. Right? You don't. You really don't. <laughs> and, and you won't be the first person who's come to a thinking where Sam Hockley, who is the digital producer of these things, plays us in with a song that leaves you thinking, do we really want to hear this discussion? I can actually because tell that you, song carry on. I can actually tell you why well, it's true. I can actually tell you that one of the highlights of the, of the years since I um, resigned as leader of the Labour Party was that I met Morton Hartwick um, uh, as a result of having mimed this on Channel 4 um, because they were recording a special something or other for the, to coincide with the billionth YouTube watch of that of the song. So I mean, Morton and I are best buddies. That is that is massive news. My sister, when she was very young, used to say to me that she thought that someone was famous if they had met someone who was famous. Yeah, and, exactly. And so by the by that you are famous. De de I definitely. You know Morton Harkett. What could be what could be bigger? He's got strong views on the environment, actually. He, he's in favour of it? He's in favour of it. Yeah, good. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. On balance, he's in favour of it, yeah. Um, All right. Well, I would like to say, um, welcome, Ehed Miliband. Thank you, Sam Hockley. This is as shambolic a start to a thinking as I think we've managed to pull off. And we pulled off some pretty dissolute ones, I can tell you. Um, welcome, everyone. It's slow news. I mean, this is slow news. I know we are, we, are, we can, for, for most of this evening, we're going to be discussing the works of our her. And if we can, we'll touch on a few other issues as well. Um, Ed, Ed this will, thank you so much for, for doing this. It's not as though there is a shortage of live and breaking news. So it's, it's very good to have you with us. Um, for, for those people who've not been to a thinking before, um, the whole idea when we started it was actually to be here in our newsroom, we'd open it up every evening and we'd have a conversation with a group of people, with one person, but it wouldn't be just us journalists interviewing or discussing things, everyone can weigh in. And so if you've not been before, I was saying to Ed just before we started, I'm gonna kick things off, but, but share your points of view, share your uh, experiences, share, share your thinking on what's happening in the world and what you think of the way in which either Ed or Labour or our political leaders are handling it. And I'll try and make sure that uh, I bring you in. Uh, my colleague, uh, Liz Mosley, who I can see is sort of wearing her disappointment well that we've uh, we stopped talking about aha and are now going to drift into heaven knows Brexit, COVID, what else? Uh, I'm sorry about that, Liz. We'll do a little of that, but we will get back to aha before too long. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna marshal things in the chat. So please do, you know, bring your point of view, bring your thoughts, and we'll um, uh, uh, and we're wearing on that. Listen, I, I wanted to add, if we could. I'm sure we're going to talk about Brexit. I'm sure we're going to talk about that the, the economy and handling of the pandemic. But I wonder whether we can start just by standing back. You 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 touched on, you know, kind of leaving the leadership of the Labour Party. I'd like to talk a bit about that. But I want to just start. We're in December, and everyone is reflecting on the year, and I just wanted to get a sense from you of what you thought you had learnt about the UK, about politics, about leadership in 2020? And that is a big question. Um, it's obviously been a terrible year um, and it's been a terrible year for sort of so many people and you know it's still going on. Um, I mean I think what's interesting about, is about the country um, and what we've sort of learned about the country. I think, I think we have seen incredible stoicism, um, a, a, an incredible community spirit, people stepping up in all kinds of ways. I see that as the shadow business sector in terms of business stepping up. Um, I think there's something, it's, it's like the sort of tide goes out and then you, you sort of see, you know, you, you kind of get where, where things are at in the country. So you see that, that very, incredible side of the country. And then you see lots of our institutions, which I think have sort of been found wanting really. You know, um, you see key, you know, all of us have been struck that so-called key workers, many of them turn out to be the, you know, least paid, uh, the most insecure, you know, the, the people we really needed when the crisis struck turn out to be, you know, 
not the most rewarded by any means. And then, you know, you have the demonstration of sort of uh, the power of some people to work from home, but other people not to work from home and to therefore to be in harm's way. What it says about the public realm, uh, what it says about the welfare safety net. I was on a call earlier on today with the wedding industry that's been really badly hit during this crisis. And, you know, lots of the people there were saying, look, you know, I can't believe the nature of the, what happens with universal credit. I own my home, I can't get universal credit. You know, uh, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm struggling. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, I, think it's, I think it's sort of revealed truths about the country, um, which, you know, we, we, we're gonna need to act on. So, so I think it's- and, and what, and what do you do then, Ed? Because the, 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 the curiosity of 2020, or possibly even this last decade, is that the inequality that you talked about that's been so viciously exposed this year, yeah. was in many ways the theme of your time as leader of the yeah. party. But it was also been a decade in which, particularly in Europe, the left has struggled to cut through and, and win the argument that it has answers to that problem of inequality. And I wonder whether it's changed your thinking about how you do address it. I mean, I think that's really true. And I think that's a good point. I, I think the way I see it is that the populist right has commandeered many of the causes that the left were, um, uh, that, that were traditionally causes of the left. And that has discombobulated the left a lot. Um, you know, that's true in some ways of Johnson. It certainly was true of Trump. Um, and, you know, Biden won, but Biden won in some senses narrowly. Um, and, you know, I think, the, I, think, I think it's been tricky for the left for, for that reason. And then if I'm frank with you, I think one of the reasons it's also been tricky for the left is that we owned the settlement of 2008, which certainly in the UK, uh, which, which produced a financial crisis. I mean, we owned it in some sense. Yeah. So, so it was harder for, I'm not making excuses because I made lots of mistakes, but so it was in, in a sense harder for the left as the kind of, and, and although, you know, uh, uh, George W. had been in power uh, in the US when the financial crisis hit, you know, it, it was still complicated because, you know, Bill Clinton was then seen as having, a, you know, when Hillary uh, was up against Trump, I always was struck two days before the election, Trump did this advert, which was all about, which could have been an advert of sort of, some of it could have been a sort of Jeremy Corbyn advert. It was all about, you know, the global elite, what they've done to you, all of that. And in a sense, so, so I think, I think there's two things happened. One is that the populist right, and it was true of the Brexit campaign as well, took some of those causes and said, we're the answer. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's Brexit or, um, you know, some of what, the, the slightly not less, less sort of policy stuff, but the kind of the Trump rhetoric. So that's one thing. Um, and there's kind of third way left to an extent owned the settlements that had been in some sense repudiated. I'm not saying that's fair or unfair, but I think that, that, that's kind of part of it. But, th but then, there's, then there's a next step to it, which is to say, let, let, let's assume both of those things are true. And I think people would see both of those things. There would also be the third critique, which is, yes, but the left itself, even in its analysis of the inequality problem, hasn't come up with ways of distributing, or as you might have it, pre-distributing, wealth or access to wealth and and I wonder whether or not you know you look back at the last decade and say actually that's the root of it we don't have an answer um well I think if I had a good answer to the question you're asking I would clearly still be doing the tortoise thinking that I'd be doing it as prime minister so <laughs> um so you know maybe the answer is sort of um uh, maybe the answer is not is not to be. I mean, look, I think that is I think that is fair. I suppose I have become maybe this goes to anticipate another question you or others might ask. 
you know, I've obviously reflected on sort of why I lost. And I think I was caught between not being reassuring enough for the people who wanted stability and not being radical enough for the people who wanted big change. Um, now, my um, sort of lesson from that is that there are, there are big, um, there is a constituency for big economic change in this country and indeed in the US. I mean, actually the most interesting, one of the most interesting facts about the recent election, the US election, is that 60% of people in Florida voted for a $15 minimum wage, a constitutional amendment for a $15 minimum wage, but they also voted for Trump. Um, now that tells you something about the sort of, the kind of shifts in, in what is going on. Um, so, and, and you know, Biden did campaign on a, on a, on a program of, of significant change, like on climate and other things. So, so I suppose it's difficult. I think the other thing I would add in though is, and maybe this partly explains some of the differences between the 2019 UK general election and the 2017 general election, is the right succeeds when it takes the argument away from these economic questions to what are called cultural questions, but I think that's a sort of slightly simplistic way of putting it. But you know, the 2017 election was not a Brexit election, which is what Theresa May wanted it to be. And Corbyn did better than expected. Yeah. Um, and the 2019 clearly was a Brexit election and Labour did very badly. Um, and I think there is something in that about, you know, if the, if the right can, can make politics about these cultural other axes, yeah. um, not about economics, then it can succeed about allying kind of working class voters to its traditional voters, which is sort of, I think, the, the kind of right, at least one element of a right wing strategy now. Um, and, and, it, and it causes significant problems for the left. So I, so I think, I think- Ed, you know, pick up on yeah. that just a second. I think that's a massively interesting point, this idea that the right can mobilize people who are frustrated by the failure of the economic deal they've got and then um, energize them on issues of culture. Right? The question I've got is why is the left struggling to do that? Why doesn't the left have issues of culture that can mobilize people in a similar way? Um, partly because I think it did look, take the issue of Brexit it clearly divided our electorate very significantly. You know, my constituency was set, voted 70% to leave. Now, actually they voted a lot to leave because of economic questions. And this goes back to my settlement point. You know, the number of people in my constituency who I met who said, I'm voting to leave because I want a better future for my children, a better future for my grandchildren. You know, that was actually the, you know, things can't get worse, we need big change. You know, these are the sort of deep, you know, these are the sort of deep forces, yeah. in a sense. And, and I guess, I guess sort of putting this together, I'd say, you know, we've, we've had three monumental crises, the financial crisis, the Brexit crisis, and the COVID crisis. Now, all of them are different in character, but all of them have revealed deep fissures about the way our country is run and who it's run for. Mm. And so I suppose, sort of fundamentally, unless we answer that, unless you, we, we the, getting on the pitch of that question is in the end what you've got to do. How is the country, how are we going to change the way the country's run? I think, yeah, I, th I think that's sort of. Well, well Ed, it's, it's, it's quite a good way for us to think about how we, we talk over the coming better part of an hour. But as I said, I want to make sure that we bring people in. And even as we were talking, I saw Aliyah Franklin. Was making a point about the the right, and Ali, you'll put the point better to Ed than I would. So, so why, why don't you wait, and then I'm going to come to Harry Moore if I might. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just saying about the general social shift that there's been towards the right wing um, with Trump and uh, even with UKIP and stuff. Um, now that's kind of put us in a position where ev every left idea seems like such an extreme. An extreme one. How do you think in the coming years that can be that shift can be reversed so that 
extreme right doesn't seem as normal and extreme left doesn't seem as extreme anymore. Do you, do you mean, Ali, the framing, it's a sort of framing question, which is what people call the Overton window, that the, that the sort of what looks like um, uh, the, the, the right has shifted what seems reasonable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that is interesting. That's an interesting uh, way of putting it. I mean, I think, I think I suppose I think about it slightly differently, but you might be right, which is people are looking for answers. People are thinking, I don't like what we've got, at least a substantial proportion of people. I, I really don't like what we've got. I really don't like the way my country's run. Um, the social, I, I sort of think about it like the social contract, the thing that binds us together has broken down for a lot of people. And then people are saying, well, what's an art, you know, give me an answer that feels equal to the scale of the challenge. I guess that's the sort of thing I was trying to get to about my own critique of myself to James is, you know, I used to think this sometimes when I was leader, if you add up all the policies, it does amount to something which matches up with the inequality that I'm talking about, maybe, but maybe it doesn't. And so I think, I think, Alia, it's, it's in a sense, the, the, the frame of what's possible has, has, has grown quite substantially, because I think people are saying, Look, I, I don't like the way things are. I want to be. I want to know how things can be better. I want to know what the. I want to know what the what the answers are to what I see in my own life. Whether it's you know I'm at work and you know I'm living in poverty or I'm worried about my kids' chances or climate. All of these things. I think people want. I think people are sort of looking for for those scale of answers. So I think I think in a sense, big scale politics has been legitimated by the scale of the of the crisis, whether that's right or left, actually, I think. And, and Ed, can I just ask, uh, Alia, thank you, because I, I, just to pick up on that, um, and I said I'd come to Harry more in a minute, but you touched on a couple of points about lessons that you've learned about leadership. You know, it's funny, I, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, there's so many of us, probably every single person on this call at some point has said something in the last year about we need better leadership or we want leadership that does X or Y. Few of us actually have tried to lead a political party or have tried to, you know, even put ourselves forward to lead a country. When you look now at what works in political leadership, do you think that, do you think that there's a whole, if you like, spectrum of personality process that is just off the table, that, that leadership has fundamentally changed in, in politics? And if so, how? That's such a difficult question. Um, I think, but I may turn out to be wrong about this. Um, I mean, I think value, I think we are in a more values-based time in terms of what people look for in terms of leadership. I think, I think people want to know sort of who do you stand up for you know who do you stand for um uh uh, uh sorry I'm just, um uh um uh sorry this is one of my kids sorry um uh so so yeah so so i think people want to know um you know that i think I think maybe what I also learned is it's sort of strategy, not tactics, right. uh, is what matters in leadership. I think people really, consistency, consistency of leadership, consistency of where you stand is really, really um, uh, important. I don't know, that's not a great answer to the question, but- um, No, but, but I see what, but, but your point is actually that kind of clarity of, of approach and sort of, I don't know if there's even a word, an unwaveringness. Right, is it is that what you see now? I mean, I, 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 think, I think I'm, I'm partly thinking you see. I think what Keir Starmer has done very well. You might expect me to say this, but I genuinely believe it. I think sort of what he's recognised is that the way the public will judge him is not on one PMQs or one thing he says, but what he has shown since April is that he gets. We're in a national crisis. And he's gonna be 
constructive, but he's going to try and hold the government to account and he's going to be sort of responsible. And I think that's quite, I, I think, I think the pre, my, my reflection, another reflection on my time as leader is that there are massive pressures to respond to the day-to-day -day immediate thing. And I think it's worse in the days of, in the, in the kind of uh, sort of Twitter era. I'm not criticizing people who are on Twitter, but it's just, it just, you're, you're constantly in this cycle. It's like, you know, it's a sort of, it's an endless cycle of response. And most people just lead their lives yeah. and form a very fleeting impression of you. Um, so I think that's important, but I think, yeah, I think, look, I think Trump does teach us something quite important, which is he, he is, you know, he, his handling of the uh, coronavirus is chilling, appalling. You know, he's responsible for lots and lots of people having died because of the way he's handled it. Um, but 70 million Americans voted for him. And I guess, and you know, lots of us will be thinking, how is that possible? Yeah. Um, and I think partly it's because he has a values frame, obviously not my values frame, he has a values frame which he has relentlessly prosecuted, relentlessly prosecuted. Um, and, you know, in a sense, we were all a bit beguiled by the polls that it was going to be a much more of a walkover than it was for Biden. And, you know, yes, he's got the Fox News infrastructure. Yes, he's got all of that, but he's, but he's relentlessly prosecuted that, that values sort of frame, I think. Ed, let, let me, let, there are a number of people who are, I'm going to bring in in a moment. I saw Ellis Palmer and Toby Smith are making a sort of pitch to, to you to say, well, how does Labour land with core voters' issues of work and the nature of kind of, quote, unquote, the worker? But I said I'd come to Harry Moy first. So I'm going to come to Harry, then I'm going to come to Ellis and Toby first. Harry, you've had your hand up since the start. Welcome. Hi, good evening, Ed. Hi. I was, um, I think, the, the points you've made about the, the difference sort of between sort of the struggles that Labour have had with respect to sort of inheriting financial settlement and, and all of that um, is has been really impactful for for Labour Party. But to me, one of the problems, one of the key problems, is that um, the right in general just seem to be very good communicators. Now I know that seems that seems to be a bit. It, it's why I've I've kind of found the government's handling of coronavirus quite strange because. The 2019 election, I thought they nailed the, com the communication and now they've just been absolutely you know, terrible at it. Um, now, I'm not sure if it's just because a lot of the stuff that they say is, is, is bullshit and it's easy to, to make, to communicate lies. But if you think back to the 2019 election, it was get Brexit done and 50 hospitals, however many police officers it was, whereas Labour was a lot more about, we're gonna spend this much money. But what does that mean? So I'm, if, if, if Labour spends, I don't know, a billion pound more on, on health, what does that actually mean? Does that mean how many more nurses, how many more hospitals? Because um, I think about my, my mother's... Harry, so Harry, so I'm just going I'm to I'm cut you off because I think let's try, sort of focus on that question of the communication and, and, and public services, just so I'm aware of time. So, Ed, do you want to address that? And I think some, somebody's sort of um, echoing the comments in the chat. I, I think... I think there's a couple of points that Harry makes that are important. I think one is um, simplicity of message and take back control and get Brexit done were very simple messages which we certainly um, uh, remember. Mind you, the many not a few in 2017 also had, was, 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 had, was relatively speaking effective. Um, but I think the second thing that he, second point he makes, which is really important, and maybe it also goes to your, we're, we're sort of piling up the list of why the left hasn't won. This is another one to add to your list, James. Uh, emotion, not just rationality, or not, not just, you know, the kind of, the, the you know, programmatic, I've got 70 policies is not really a great, you know, it's not going to get you that far. You know, speak to, this is what I'm sort of saying to Harry about values, you know, speak to people's values, speak to kind of, you know, you get what people are feeling about the country. 
Um, that's what take back control did, I think, actually. It got to the sense that people felt the country was in different ways that they had lost control. I mean, by the way, I think it spoke to lots of left issues, as I said, like risk. I think one of the biggest issues we don't talk about enough in our society is risk. What do I mean by that? Um, I mean that the, the post-war settlement was based on the idea that risk would be shared between the state, business, and the individual. And we see risk massively loaded onto individuals. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking so much about the current situation we're in, but, but just more generally, economic risk massively loaded onto the individual, pension risk loaded onto the individual, um, all kinds of risks loaded into, and I think actually think take back control was speaking partly to that. You know, again, there was an old social contract where risk seemed fairly shared and that had gone. So, so I think, I think Harry's points are right, basically, and important. And can I, can I do, I'm, I, I said I was going to come in a moment to, to Ellis and Toby. Can I do just a brief handbrake turn, which is, you touched on Brexit and the division of the le uh, left over Brexit. Yeah. Can you touch on where we are today, Ed? What's your read on the likelihood of a deal and, and what, that, what that deal, if it's done, means? What happens next? I mean... We, you and I were talking about this before we just before we came on, weren't we? So mm. my view is that there is going to be a deal, but I mean I know as much as you do, less maybe. Um, my view is that there is going to be a deal. Why do I believe there's going to be a deal? Because I think it's so irrational for both sides not to have a deal. The consequences of no deal for the UK, the Office of Budget Responsibility said two percent of GDP. Um, are massive. Now, some people might say, ah, oh, yes, but, you know, Brexit was going to lead to, you know, worse economic outcomes over the long term. It, I think it's a different kettle of fish because of, you know, the impact of no deal, the, the sort of, the, the really quite very, very, very serious, and I talk to businesses all the time about this, very, very serious impacts on, you know, a whole range of people, manufacturers, farmers, agriculture, just across the board, massive, massive impact. So, I sort of think it's in the UK's interest strongly to have a deal. It's in the EU's interest to strongly have a deal. My sense about the EU is that you can say lots of things about them, but what they have a way of doing is fudging differences and sort of finding a way to kind of resolve them, kick the can down the road, you know, paper over the cracks, come back at a later date. I think that's what will happen. I, I, you know, and obviously, I hope very, very, very much that that's what happens. And, and is that, and just in the sort of pure politics terms, a deal liberates the Labour Party as much as it liberates the Conservative Party? I both sides are then free to to get on with other things. Do you think? I mean, I think it's more about honestly. I don't want to sound pious, but I mean, it's more about the country. I mean, it's just so terrible for the country. Right. You know, people will lose their jobs, businesses will go under. I mean, it's just, I just think, you know. I mean, what's the thing we've feared ever since June the 23rd? Mm. It's no, it's, it's exiting without a deal. Mm. I mean, that's why I think it's, you know, that's why it's just so imperative that we get one. So, so, so and I said, I bring Ellis in because Ellis had made this uh, point about how Labour gets back to the, and I suppose it's connected to Brexit in 2016 too, but gets back to, hello, Ellis. Well, um, welcome, okay. thanks for joining us. But, but, but put your point to end. <laughs> I guess it is that kind of question of how does the European Union in general make an issue like climate change that's seemingly post-materialist appeal to its core vote, which is primarily concerned with materialist issues? And how does one message something like the Green New Deal, say, without having their clothes stolen by the right, yeah. i.e. taking the policy but keeping it as greenwashing and maybe not comsing it? The most efficient economic. Good question. Right, good, good question. Um, I think Ellis, it's interesting. This there's a there's a really good report done, which I would recommend you and others look up um, by the organisation called More in Common, um, mm -hmm. looking at it came out recently, surveying voters after well in the midst of coronavirus, um, and they say there are three issues that can unite the country: jobs, the NHS, not surprising, and climate. Um, and it's interesting, and, and, and you know, that is kind of surprising. And now, why do they say that? They say that because it's not just a group of voters who consider this their number one issue 
who care about this. It's a broad spectrum of voters, including centre-right voters, uh, as well as centre-left voters. And by large majorities, people think it's going to be good for the economy, not bad. And that's my, the, my answer to your question. What do I learn from my 10 or so years of dealing with this issue? Of course, it's a massive environmental issue, but it's so much more than an environmental issue. It's got to be an issue of economic and social justice. You know, the way I think about it is ambition, yes, jobs and fairness. They, they're the three things that you need in relation to this um, question. And in a sense, maybe this is a, another criticism to add to James's ever-expanding list of the left. You know, this is about better lives for people. It's not a sellout to say, we think lives can be better. Lives can be better because of the jobs people can do, because of air quality, because of green spaces, um, because of the way cities and towns are organized, because of bike lanes, because, you know, a whole list of things. I mean, I sometimes joke, you know, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, and, and I think we're very, very good. And, and of course, you know, Extinction Rebellion, the pupil climate strikers rightly say you've got to be truth telling about the nightmare. Correct. Um, that's not wrong. But we've, you've also got to talk about the positive, the positive vision. But, and, and, and on the, by the way, on this thing about Johnson, I think you asked about Johnson. I actually really glad he's talking about this issue. Honestly, I think it's good. I, I think if we can make the next election a sort of climate competitive election, great. You know, Ed, sorry, can I, can I just ask you one thing yeah. just on a substantial point on, regarding this climate point? We, we talked earlier in the summer, you know, in the teeth of the pandemic, very high levels of anxiety around what's going to happen around youth unemployment, and particularly this kind of national consciousness now, not just this year, but in the last few years, yeah. around the climate emergency. And at the time, you were talking about the idea of a sort of conservation call. Yeah, definitely. So, so can you just tell us a bit about that idea? I well, look, we, we said the government should bring forward 30 billion over the next 18 months for a green recovery. And that will be, a, and we think it could create 400,000 jobs. And that is about all of the jobs that need doing from, you know, tree planting to retrofit, to making zero carbon engines of the future, to manufacturing electric buses. I mean, it's, obviously there's so much to be done. By the way, I think the care the care sector, in a sense, should. Little, be hold on, sorry, can, can I just can I just stick with this yeah. for one second? Because I'm interested in your point. You know, you talked about reassuring versus radical. Right? Yeah. And I was really intrigued because I think when we talked about it at the time. Yeah. I think you'd been reading something about FDR Roosevelt. and Roosevelt in three the three million he three put three million men um, in a back to work in something called the Civilian Conservation Corps, planting some billions of numbers of trees and goodness knows what else. So here's my, uh, here's my point, uh, and I, I'm interested in the sort of radical and the, and the reassuring. When politicians say, oh, we're going to have a Green New Deal and it's going to create X thousand jobs, I think a lot of us glaze over because, you know, actually to Harry's point, it's quite hard to digest that. It's not clear exactly the, the point that's landed. Is there a nervousness that you have still about coming out and saying, we're going to create an FDR style mm -hmm. New Deal around the climate, which also involves mass employment for young people. Is that kind of intervention just one that might scare the horses, one that, one that might feel expensive, one that might feel actually- really? I mean, not really, off. because, I mean, Annalisa Dodds and I did talk about this a few weeks ago, and, and in a sense, you know, everyone's focus is so on the virus, it's not surprising that, you know, people are focusing slightly elsewhere, but I think it's gonna become a, as we, you know, if you think ahead to next year, you know, we, you know, we hope with all our heart that the vaccine gets properly rolled out um, and we get through the health crisis, but we're not going to be through the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. And so I think these questions, I, I think, I think next year is going to be a very interesting year in politics. With all of these questions are going to hove into view. What mm -hmm. lessons we learn from the crisis. I don't, I don't, I don't so much mean, did the government too late go into lockdown? Well, that's all important. But I mean, what are the deeper lessons we learn about the country? I think, that, just going back to this more in common report, James, it's really interesting. You know, so many people say, we don't just want to go back to business as usual. We want to get back to normal, but we don't want to just go back to the way things were before. Mm -hmm. I was just reading something about flexible working, and it's an astonishing figure that 94% of people who worked flexibly 
during the crisis for the first time say they want to carry on doing so. Wow. And so I think, I think there's a really interesting question, both on the green thing that you've talked about and more generally about, you know, 2021 will, I think, be the pivot point of, of politics. And I hope, you know, I hope so with all my heart because the vaccine works and, and gets rolled out into the future and what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. well, well, Ed, I, I'm going to bring a couple more people. I said I'd come to um, Robert Campbell, who I see has got his hand up, and Sophie Dacloui, who's got uh, her hands up too. Um, uh, Robert, why don't I come to you first? Are you there? Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, hi. Hi. The, the last couple of minutes has been kind of um, edging towards what I would want to, to say was, and I think there was a we've touched on it a couple of times, the left or the progressive side of politics really hasn't been able to articulate a vision, the kinds of things that you've just talked about, um, Green New Deal, um, progressive way of um, operating the workplace and a whole bunch of other things. We haven't articulated a vision that hits home clearly, succinctly and emotionally with the majority of people. We've stepped quite quickly into um, rationality and big lists of things and everything else and we compete against get Brexit done and the obvious lies the thing that really stands out to me about politics at the moment is that we can talk rationally and the middle classes can um, intellectualize about everything and we can look very positively and all we are competing against is a three-line slogan an out and out demonstrable lies and um, hypocrisy that we can see from the right um, Daniel Hannan saying we're never going to lose, uh, leave the single market or the customs union, and yet that's exactly what we're doing. And he says that's what we promised. It, it, this lack of um, a clearly understood, succinct vision, which incorporates a lot of the things that we've just talked about over the last two or three minutes. How yeah. do we move to that position? Robert, thank you. Ed? Well, look, I think it's a good question, Robert. Um... I mean, look, I think in the end, I suppose what I've concluded is you, you've got to just talk about big ideas and then and and you take your chances in a sense. And if the electorate wants to vote for them, they will. I mean, I, I don't mean to say that messaging is an important consistency of message, simplicity of messaging, all of these things. But I personally think there's a big appetite for economic change in this country. And I think if Labour talked about it, which I think we are doing and will, and as we come out of coronavirus, will do so more. Um, I think people will turn to us. And if they don't turn to us, well, they want something else. But I don't, I sort of think, I think that's kind of a lesson I learned from, from you know, 2015. I don't spend lots of time dwelling on, on 2015, but I think, you know, in retrospect, I would have preferred people had more of a sense of the kind of Britain I wanted and the kind of scale of change I wanted not less change, but more change. And I think that's the, you know, the next election is going to be a change election because, because Johnson, you know, what is Johnson trying to do with the so-called red wall seats? He's trying to say, I can deliver change for you. Now, personally, I don't think he can because and this goes to ideology. I don't think of the free market vision, you know, if, if my constituents are still on zero hours contracts and still on credibly low wages, I don't think he's going to have addressed the deep issues, just to take two examples, the deep issues about the way the economy works and who it works for. I think these are deep issues. I don't think Boris Johnson can um, address them. I think, in a sense, yes. I agree New Deal is important, for example. Um, Ed, th thank you. And Robert, right. to so Sophie. Hi, I'm um, I'm a huge fan. I've been in a Millie fandom for a long time, so hope you're well. Um, my question is, as a spectator, I've noticed almost like a witch hunt takedown of leaders' image um, in the past, especially I saw it a lot with yourself in the 2015 general election. There's a lot of focus on your image just as an individual. Um, we even see it on the right as well with Theresa May and with Jeremy Corbyn. Um, so my question for you is how much do you agree with this? And what do you think needs to be done in politics to shift the focus back to ideology? Um, I guess it kind of links into like populism as well and kind of like the presidential 
nature of elections now what do you think we need to do to kind of get back to the ideology and like focus on the most important issues Sophie, thank you i mean it's really good look it's a really good question i, I suppose i you know yes we have a relatively right-wing press in this country and so you know it's not a hospitable environment for labor leaders um uh but i think i suppose i think in a sense we're in an era when you can communicate directly to people now i think it's quite it's quite problematic as we know i mean if you look at some of the conspiracy theories being peddled in the us q anon conspiracy and other things it's incredibly scary what's got what gets peddled on on aspects of social media and i think 2019 was a social media election a Facebook election in a way that 20, even 2017 wasn't actually. Hmm. I, I really felt it. Um, and, and look, it's incredibly choppy waters that you're having to navigate um, with, with fake news being spread. But, but, but I think, you know, there is an opportunity to communicate more directly with people. That's what you've got to do. You've got to find ways in which you rebut the lies that are told about you. Um, and, you know, and, and, and then you've got to have people, explore, you know, this is why the hundreds of thousands of members of the Labour Party has are important, because then you've got to get out and get the message out to people. And in a sense, yeah. So, I mean, the trouble is with this is that it's a really good question, Sophie, but it's like, what's the art? You know, there's, there's not an easy answer to this question, apart from using all the tools at your disposal. And Ed, can I can I just can I just have a crack if I like, picking up on Sophie's point that says okay, let's move away from style to a to a question of substance. I don't know how many people have heard the second part of Mark Carney's Wreath Lectures, which ran this morning. The first ran last week, and if you didn't, they're really worth hearing. Yeah, they're 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 an argument against the primacy of markets and the way in which market values have begun wow. to erode social values. Wow. Completely agree. And, and it's really interesting, you know, a governor of the, or former governor of the Bank of England weighing in in that way. The, wow. the, the, the question I've got on the substance, Ed, is if at the end of this year there is a clarity, and even if you like a popular radicalization around the extent of inequality in the country, but there's also a realization that the labor prescription so far, whether it's around nationalizations or whether it's around tax or whether it's, you know, whatever, hasn't cut through because it hasn't given people enough confidence that it would not just, it would not just improve the imbalance, but it would raise, the, raise all boats. What's, what's your argument now for what that labour prescription should be. And I'm asking you, I suppose, with You're an asking eye the easy question. Yeah, but not with an eye to your past job, but actually with the eye to this one, with this business secretary job. Because actually now you do have an argument to say, we're going to need a new contract with companies. This is what we want. That it's about wealth, that it's better for wealth creation as well as wealth distribution, fundamentally. You know, I think what's really interesting about this, James, is if you look at, if you look at what's changed, in, in the business world, um, uh, maybe since I was leader, is that business is leading the argument for change in lots of these areas. They're leading the argument for change on climate. Mm -hmm. They're leading the argument, if you look at the B Corps, which some people will know about, um, they're leading the argument for purpose-driven companies, not simply because it'll be better for their workers, yes, it will, but it will be better for uh, wealth creation. You know. If you think about issues around productivity, we're stuck in a low wage, low productivity cycle in this country. Uh, actually, we've got to, got to get out of it. And one of the ways of getting out of it is greater fairness of the workplace. Um, I, I, think, I, I think we can lead an argument which is about wealth creation as well as wealth distribution. And maybe I didn't do that well enough. But, but isn't um, it, can, can I just put to you, Ed, this is, yeah. this is that one of the things, someone wrote in the chat that there's a risk that Keir Starmer looks like he's the person that's abstaining. Right, in the light of last week's vote. I'd make an argument that I understand that point of view, but even on, a, on the bigger issue of how the government should respond to the economic crisis that's unfolding, Labour's ducking the big choice. Either it says, look, we're going to have to balance the books, right? We're going to be, if you like, a bit more Rishi Sunak, and we're going to make sure that we don't borrow beyond our means. Or it says, 
more along the lines of Alistair Darling and Ed Balls back in the day, is look, we can afford to borrow now. Interest rates are low. We are going to borrow much, much more because we're going to spend now. And we're going to, we, although that's not currently... We, the, are, we, we are, I mean, look, sorry, for the sake of clarity, we are definitely saying not acting now is worse, is, is, is worse than acting. In other words, we need no, to act say, now. We, we, not we, saying we need to act not. To, so on unemployment. We need to act now. That's why I said we should bring forward thirty million. Well, no, no, but everyone's going to no, no, but everyone's going to agree with that. My point. Well, no, is, no, not really. Because you know, hold, on, hold, hold on, hold on. But, sorry, the point I'm trying to make to you is yeah. At the moment, Rishi Sunak and the sort of Treasury orthodoxy is let's try and get debt to 100 percent of GDP. Labour hasn't come out and said, no, no, we think we can go to 120%. We can have a proper spend for the next few years so that we can fund the kind of investment in jobs and public services. Well, I think fucking a debt to GDP figure out the air is not right. I actually analyze the situation differently. I think what Rishi Sunak is doing is trying to, set, trying to pretend that he gets that you've got to be a Keynesian in this, in this time of crisis, yeah. but he's fundamentally not delivering on the promise. Um, but and, he's, mm-hmm. and he's fundamentally he's fundamentally not delivering. You know, unemployment seems like from the OBR it's going to go up by a million. That's what they're saying. Um, you know, he's he's actually on the green recovery. He's not acting he's, uh, on unemployment. Use unemployment. He's not properly acting. So so I actually think the the divide is between him who claims to be acting, uh, or supporting business. He's not really acting as much as he should. But, but so, do you think? Ed, what I'm asking is, do you think that the government should be spending and borrowing more? Well, I think they should be spending now, definitely, definitely. That's why we said, for that's why I'm talking about the the 30 billion, for example, because you should be bringing forward because because not acting now is definitely worse right now. But I'd make I'd, the other thing. I'd make another point to you though, which is this is an important argument for now, but it's probably not going to be the argument of the next election. Mm-hmm. The argument of the next election is going to be different. Now, I think the argument of the, le- of the next election is going to be who can. Who can reform the old economy we had, which is too insecure for people, too unequal, not fair, not productive, high carbon, to turn it into a new economy that can actually deliver for people? And I actually, so I actually think, and look, I think the battleground of now is really important because people, jobs, businesses depend on it. But I think that the battleground of the next election will be that. Right. Okay. For, 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 let, let me take in a few points because I've got slightly sidetracked by, let's face it, by not insignificant things. Um, uh, Amber's had her hands up and Sally Young too. Um, and so I'm going to come to Amber and then you, Sally. And if you'll take both points there, that would that would be great. Sa- Amber. Um, I was just going to ask with the um, electoral makeup of the system at the moment, um, with Labour losing all of its like traditional voters, how, are, how is the Labour Party going to manoeuvre itself out of this rock and the hard place between its traditional more conservative with the small C voters and its more uh, liberal middle class voters. How is it going to do that? Um, um, but thank you. Um, and I'm just going to bring in Sally as well and then, uh, and then ask you to sort of respond to both. Sally Young. Hi, Ed. Completely different question. Um, I love reasons to be cheerful. And I wonder how you managed to reconcile your very personal, um, funny persona in that with a more intellectual political persona, which we're used to seeing, and some of the joys and horrors of doing that. That's a really good question. Great question. Sally. Um, just for the people who are not, who are, who are on the call, I, Sally has given me an opportunity to plug my podcast, which I'm extremely delighted about. Um, <laughs> uh, downloadable on all good platforms. We'd like five star reviews, please. Um, uh, the, the, the way I see, I'll come to Amber's question in a second. The way I see it, Sally, is it's a chance for me to talk about ideas, which is what I care about, and to, you know, in a way relevant to my job and, and, and more sort of generally um, uh, relevant. Um, I think this thing of personality is interesting. James has sort of not exactly asked me about this, but I mean, he could ask me about it, you know, I, the way I sort of put it is, you know, after 2015, people have discovered that I have a personality. Um, and I think, I mean, there is some, there's an interesting question about, you know, political leadership and the, and it, I think it goes to a question that was asked earlier, um, I think it was Sophie, uh, about, um, you know, in a sense, you tread on eggshells as a Labour leader. And sometimes when you tread on eggshells, and I think actually that's another thing that people don't really want from politics these days, people want 
people have such sort of antennae for politicians saying the line that they want they want kind of as you know authenticity really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was too constrained. I, I think I was too constrained by the position. Some of it for good reasons, some of it for not good reasons. So but what I try and do in the podcast is to try and be sort of um, somewhat human. Um, the, um, on Amber's uh, very good question, I think add that to the list as well, James's list, um, which is about the changing nature of the, the center left base. I mean, that, you're, you're bang on Amber. That, that has been a massive issue for us. That we have got an increasing, um, you know, it's partly the a good thing people, many more people go to university. We have many more graduates supporting us. Uh, it goes somewhat to these cultural issues. My answer to you, though, is I was part of a inquest into not just the 2019 election, but into previous elections as well, uh, the Labour Together report. And we looked at these issues in quite some detail. In fact, we brought together in a sort of citizen's jury, I think it's the first time this was done, the, some of those graduate people who had stayed with us and the, and the sort of working class voters who'd left us. And we brought them together to kind, of, to kind of come up with what they think Labour should be about. It was a rather interesting process, liberation. And what I take from that, goes back to something I said at the beginning, is economic change is the uniting issue. Economic change is what, whether you're a graduate, a non-graduate, whoever you are, mm. You think there's deep issues in relation to our economy, the inequality of our economy, and so on, uh, which need to be which need to be dealt with. So, so that's kind of my sort of rather simple answer to you. Uh, uh, th thank you. Economic change is a really interesting answer. I, I, Medias Gauri has once asked a question about leadership, and I think Samuel Bruning does too. So, so Medias and, and Samuel, I'm going to come to you. Medias, you want to go first? Thank you. Thank you, James. Hey, I've got a question to ask with regard to the leadership. Admittedly, the Brexit was a tectonic um, yeah. shift, if you like, in the political fortunes. But what we've actually been seeing, the way the both parties, both political parties, have conducted themselves. At the end of last parliament, we saw the whip withdrawn from 23 Conservative MPs. Some of them old grandies, Kenneth Clark, Christopher Soames, etc. Last month, we saw the whip being withdrawn from Jeremy Corbyn, an immediate ex-leader of the, of the Labour Party. Is this the new normal, if you like? Is that something which is, we should be expecting? Or are we going to be back to the more civilized uh, conduct of the two big parties. Maybe, thank you. It's a good question. Um, Samuel, I'm going to invite you to make a point and ask it, then Ed to respond to both. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I could have a chance to talk to you, but uh, first of all, um, I recently was reading Deborah Matinson's new book, Beyond the Red Wall, um, and I found it quite interesting that a lot of the uh, talk about the 2019 election was um, about how where Brexit and Corbyn were at fault for Labour's defeat. But actually, as you noted in the Labour Together report on the election defeat, there are causes to go back decades. And so my question is, why, if Boris Johnson fails to level up, why will voters go to Keir Starmer and not to a populist leader who looks more device, more um, more likely to make decisions, but also more likely to divide? Uh, so basically, can Keir Starmer win back the seats? Thank I mean, you. Look, it's a, good, it's, a good, it's a good question. I'll start with that and I'll come to Medi Medi's question. I mean, you know, my majority went down a lot in the 2019 election. So in a sense, I, 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 not, I mean, in a sense, it's easier if I speak from my own personal sort of experience. I mean, Labour voters left us because, partly because of leadership, um, as Labour Together said, um, partly because they felt alienated by the second referendum position Brexit, frankly, um, and they felt it was a sort of breach of trust with them. Um, and partly because they didn't sort of really believe we could deliver. Although I think, I think the sort of, the third was sort of related to the first two. Um, now, I think it's true, as Deborah's book says, that, that, that a lot of this was a long time coming and actually, 
we looked in the Labour Together report at a lot of the seats the Tories won, and the Tories had gone up in 2017 in a lot of those seats, so it had been sort of coming. Um, but, but that said, I don't believe that those voters who left us in 2019, certainly thinking about my voters, who left, the voters in my constituency who left us in 2019 and others, are, lots of them wanted to vote Labour actually. Lots of them felt very painful about not voting Labour. I mean, they'd say to me, you know, you might think I would say this, they'd say, look, I like you as an MP, I really want to vote for you, but I can't vote for you for the following reasons. Um, I had lots and lots of those conversations. People, it wasn't like, oh, I'm really sort of pleased to be deserting Labour, you know, I'm, I'm sort of delighted. You know, lots and lots of people said, my whole family's always been Labour, etc. Now, I don't in any sense they take it for granted that we can win the back, but I think if we show that we can actually transform the country in some of the ways that they would want to see, I think we, we absolutely can win them back. Mehdi, on your question, I think the two things are unrelated. I mean, you know, one was about Brexit um, and to do with the things in the Conservative Party. The, 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 the Jeremy issue was to do with the issue of anti-Semitism um, and, and, and what was said on the day of the um, EHRC report. Um, so I, I really don't, don't think, you know, they're the same thing. And, and just sort of for the sake of clarity, you know, I think Kira is completely right that we've got to deal with this issue of, of anti-Semitism and this, you know, very sorry chapter that we had around anti-Semitism. Anyone reading the EHRC report, um, you know, you really should give one pause about sort of what happened. And, you know, we don't want the, you know, phrase, the, the, the kind of words Labour Party and anti-Semitism in the same sentence at the next general election. Ed, Ed thank you. Uh, we're just coming towards the end. I see Clarissa Attlee has also been, uh, had a point she wanted to make. And so Clarissa, I'm going to give you the last question before I ask one final thing to you, Ed. Clarissa. Thank you, Sam. Um, James, sorry. <laughs> I was, um, hi, Ed. Um, I was wondering, how do you think the government can lead change in the economy to combat negative impacts of climate change? Um, sorry, I'm aware that's not a small question. Um, I'd no, like to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, it's a really good question. Uh, there's this thousand page report that's come out today, Clarissa, from the Climate Change Committee, which is the thing that I was I set, helped set up in the Climate Change Act. I mean, it is, I, I confess I haven't read it all yet. Um, but it's a, it's a sort of stonking document and it's in a way quite um, salutary about the change that we need. And I think I, I just wanted to go to the heart of this issue because I think the heart of this issue is that there are going to be, well, what's fascinating about the report is it says in net terms, I even take into account the expenditure we have to make and the savings that we're going to make from going green, it sort of nets out at zero, believe it or not. They basically say you can get to net zero by, by investing quite a lot up front, but the savings you get um, actually end up recouping the money. Now, why is that? Because electric cars are going to be cheaper than petrol cars, because onshore wind is now the cheapest form of um, power, because of a whole range of reasons. So, so, I mean, there's lots of things government can do, but the fundamental thing that government is going to have to do is manage this change and manage this change in a way that is fair. And that is not taken... You can't take that for granted because yeah. because like the cost just just take the household sector i mean how we change the way we heat our homes heat pumps hydrogen all of that it's going to be an absolutely massive change and it's got massive costs and government is going to have to find a way of defraying those costs making those costs fair so so i think the sort of i mean the fundamental duty of government is to show the ambition that's necessary and i could bore on for a long time maybe i'll come back Talk about next year, talk about COP26, which I think is an incredibly important event, and uh, there's lots to say about it. But they've got to show ambition. We need it to be a motive for jobs, but crucially, it's got to be delivered in a fair way because that thing I said about building this constituency um, for change, it can only be done if we do it fairly. And if it isn't just, well, you can afford to go green if you're middle class, but, but and not if you don't have the money. Ed, I'm going to, I'm, I will see we run in further, but I want to finish up with one final thought, which is many people will have been struck this year by the argument, and I've seen it in the chat, between Andy McBurnham, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, your former uh, colleague in the Cabinet, and, and, and at the same time, uh, and Boris Johnson. 
And there's been a very strong argument about reviving our politics by getting closer to a sense of place. And in England, that's about much greater and more meaningful devolution for those metro areas. I just wonder what you think about that, because it seems to me as though Labour faces a big choice, which is on the one hand, let's give more power to those metro mayors, but on the other hand, an unresolved position about Scottish independence. And I wonder whether or not, if you want to devolve power to place, you've got to have Labour backing both Scottish independence and the likes of metro mayors in-, in Definitely Africa. not. I mean, the, um, no, because that's the whole point. You know, we've got, we've had devolution for Scotland and Wales, but we'd like it in England, please. I mean, right. I'm a tunnel supporter of devolution, um, and I'm not a supporter of independence. And, you know, where's my choice? My choice is totally for devolution. Let me give you a very concrete example. You know, what's one of the biggest issues I have in my constituency is about the local bus services and the problems with the local bus services. You know, who do I sort of get in touch with about the bus services? Well, for about 14 years or 13 years, I, I wrote to the South Yorkshire Passenger Transport Authority, um, you know, which is sort of indirect form of accountability. But, you know, people are like, well, what are you going to do about the bus services? I have to write to somebody who's not really elected and so on. Now, fortunately, we now have a South Yorkshire uh, mayor, Dan Jarvis, who has a bit more power over the bus services. But we are... We are far too centralized as a country. That's one, that's one of the reasons, a big reason, why we're incredibly unequal as a country. So I completely go for devolution. I mean, to, I, I'm totally for um, uh, devolution. I think you could find a way of reforming the House of Lords so it you know, has a, you know, the regions and nations. I mean, you know, we've got to learn the lessons. What, what you know, oh. Anyway, sorry, I'll shut up. No, 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 no. I'm, I, I'm excited to hear. And by the way, I always love the fact that when, so, when finally we turn to a politics that is really, really direct and, and immediate to people, I saw the people, as you were saying, yes, I totally agree with Ed on the buses. And I always feel as though that's probably a lesson for all of us, which is the more we get to abstractions, the more we get away from politics that matters to people. Um, listen, Ed, we've run over on time, which we were always bound to do. I just wanted to say uh, apologies to a number of people who've had their hands up or made really fascinating points in the chat that we didn't get a chance to come to. But a big thank you to you, uh, Ed, as I said, as we come to the end of uh, this year, but also we come to uh, the end of what's sort of a be, been a, a busy day uh, in politics. Um, for, for you for sparing the time. Um, I've asked Sam Hockley to, uh, to play us out uh, with the same sense of kind of uh, um, uh, musical wonder as he played this in. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and I turn uh, you over to the double act that is uh, Ed Miliband and Milton Hockley. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. so much. Too.